he talked about how the, the cost of the pair of hands is, you know, accountants go nuts over that. They, they understand it. They analyze it six different ways from sundown. You know, it cascades up to, you know, all the, you know, absorption rates, all that kind of crap. And, but there is no offsetting value on the balance sheet for what's in the head. And so it's purely a cost when, you know, all of us know that a person, yeah, there's, there's maybe a payroll cost, but there's all this value too that, it more than balances it out, especially if you use it right. And and uh, it, that's what leads to these companies making these screwball decisions to, you know, let's move a manufacturing operation, you know, you know 2,000 miles away to save a buck an, an hour in labor. What's up, everybody? This is Paul Critchley, president of New England Lean Consulting. Welcome to another episode of the New England Lean Podcast. I'm so excited to bring you this episode this week because we've got Kevin Meyer. Kevin Meyer is the co-founder of Gemba Academy, which provides over 2,000 Lean and Six Sigma videos to thousands of organizations worldwide. Uh, certainly, if you listen to this show, you know that Gemba Academy has a podcast. I've actually been on that one. That's kind of how I got a first taste. I think it was the first podcast I was ever on years ago. Um, so if you like this show, I, I know you'll like theirs. So hit that one up too. Uh, after receiving a degree in chemical engineering from Rensselaer Polytech in the early 80s, Kevin worked in automotive lighting for a few years before spending most of the rest of his career in medical devices at a place called Abbott Laboratories. Uh, he then became president of Specialty Silicone Fabricators uh, and then left there and started Gemba Academy. And I'll say the rest is history. I mean, certainly if you're in the Lean or Six Sigma space, you've heard about Gemba Academy. Uh, now, Kevin has been heavily involved with Lean organizations such as AME, which I support as well. Um, and he's the author of The Simple Leader, Personal and Professional Leadership at the Nexus of Lean and Zen. And I'm not just saying this because I have an enormous amount of respect for Kevin and because he was a guest on the podcast, but no kidding, this is one of my favorite lean books ever. So I can't say enough about it. If I try to sell you on it, I'll do an awful job. So I'll just say, if you haven't read it, do yourself a favor and pick up a copy and 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 give it a look. It's it's pretty moving. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Kevin lives in the a small fishing village, she calls it, of Morro Bay, California, which is on the Pacific Coast Highway, halfway between L.A. and San Francisco. And if you don't follow him on Twitter, Twitter, you should. Uh, he posts uh, these these amazing pictures of these California sunsets over the beach that is right outside his house. You know, usually there's a glass of wine somewhere around that you can you can see in the you know periphery. So. Uh, you know, he's living the life, and I was teasing him a little bit about that here on the show. Um, so in this episode, you know, we we talk a little bit about, we both have a similar disdain for the word transformation, and I won't go off here in the intro. If you listen to the show, you know where I stand on that one. We also talk about the difference between, you know, a mission statement and vision versus you know, uh, leading and managing based on principles and values. And I think he makes very eloquent um correlations there much better than I could. Uh, but I, I happen to agree with him um, on some of the statements he, or on, on the statements that he made, because, you know, when we, uh, I'll lead a workshop and I'll talk about mission statements and I'll say, you know, I bet your mission statement, something like we seek to be the supplier of choice for XYZ widget or service, you know, worldwide and blah, 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 blah. Right. And generally people are nodding. And I said, I'll bet you, you couldn't recite it, but you know, it's posted in the break room and people are like, yep, that's basically what it is. So I'm not a huge fan of them either. Uh, we also talk about being tool heads. Um, so we talk a lot about just that, you know, we both made the same mistake and I don't know if that's because we're both engineers. I, I don't know, but uh, we both made the same mistake early in our careers where we really focused a lot on the tools of lean and kind of, I'll say missed the mark. I'll speak for myself um, on that one where we kind of uh, undersold the culture piece and how important that was. So it was really a great episode. I was so happy to be able to finally see Kevin. He and I have had some some near misses. We were supposed to hook up and, and meet up at AME Chicago 
uh, a few years ago. He couldn't make it, and obviously everything's been virtual for a while. So it was good to at least see him if just on a video screen. And I hope, you know, the day comes soon that we actually get to meet up in person and uh, and share a glass of wine and trade some stories. So as always, I hope you like it, and I hope you get something from it. Have a great week, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. All right, welcome to the New England Lean Podcast. My name is Paul Critchley. I am your host, and today I am very excited to have Kevin Meyer with us. Kevin, hello. Hello, thank you. How have you been? Um, it's been an interesting year. <laughs> so. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so we follow each other on Twitter, so I see all your, you know, uh, California coast sunsets and the wine glass <laughs> and the whole thing, mm. and I'm like, man... How do I get that guy's life? <laughs> well, that, that's been an interesting thing in the last year. I've, uh, I, I was thinking about, I don't know who asked me, if it was Mark Raven or someone, but or is in one of the discussions we're having. And it's like, yeah, how many times have I worn long pants in the last year? And I think very literally, I think it's probably about three. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's like, you know, what can you do? So, yeah. Well, hey, it's it's good work if you can get it, Kevin. I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. very jealous over here in <laughs> Connecticut. I mean, we're just now in springtime, so it's mm -hmm. it's very warm and like the grass is finally growing and everything. But I mean, I think you now you went to Rensselaer, right? Yes. All right, so Back you know what 80s, the weather so. can be like over here. Yes, and I actually I started on the off semester too, so I flew up in the middle of a blizzard in January to start school. And had to trudge up the hill. Those of you that know the campus is this tall hill, and and you know find security and all that at 11 p.m. and find my way to the dorm. And I was like, "What the heck have I done?" Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Somehow made it. I so I went to Clarkson. So we're big <laughs> hockey rivals. We played you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'll tell you a similar story. Uh, my first master's degree, I ended up moving to South Carolina um, for work for a little while. Mm -hmm. So I took a class at Clemson. And the same mm -hmm. as you. Now, Clarkson, for those who don't know, is in Potsdam, New York. And it's way up near the Canadian border, way up on the eastern hump. So it's like Syracuse and two and a half hours north of there. So it's very mm -hmm. far north. Um, it literally snowed the day I graduated in May. So, <laughs> right, contrast that to I'm in South Carolina in summer and I drive to the Clemson campus and it's 180 degrees different. And I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. Why did I go to school where I, where I went? I could have been down mm -hmm. here, but yep. in any event. So Kevin, I'm sure a lot of people who listen to the show, I'm sure probably know who you are, but on the off chance that we're reaching somebody who doesn't, could you maybe just hum a few bars about your background and kind of what you've been up to? Uh, well, the, the real brief history is I got a degree in chemical engineering from Rensselaer back in the 80s. Uh, worked for Sylvania Lighting as a manufacturing engineer for a few years, then uh, decided uh, the Boston area was a little too cold, so I moved to California um, and uh, worked for Abbott Labs making medical devices, mostly drug infusion pumps, uh, for many years, actually for 10 years, eventually at their Salt Lake plant, uh, running a molding facility for them then. And then uh, decided to move to California again and uh, did some telecom work, but ended up at another uh, silicone uh, medical device company uh, that I was president of for about eight years. And then uh, while doing that and uh, doing lean all through those years, I was, you know, I was introduced to lean it, inadvertently during uh, at the Sylvania days and then very formally in the Abbott days. And um, But I uh, got together with John uh, Miller and Ron Pereira and we started Gimba Academy. And that is, that was in 2009. So what is that? 11 years now, I guess, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and we've been doing that ever since. Uh, just uh, creating a lot of videos for people on how to do lean and Six Sigma. Mm -hmm. So how can, so I did want to ask about that a little bit because a lot of people know, I mean, certainly, you know, I've been on the Gemba Academy podcast years ago with Ron mm -hmm. and I uh, had dinner with him and some of, some of the Gemba Academy crew at AME in Chicago a couple of years ago when we mm -hmm. could all actually get together and see each other. Yeah, What a novel concept. But I wanted to know, because I honestly don't know the history behind Gemba Academy. I know obviously what it is today. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how did you guys find each other? How did you develop that idea? 
we we knew of each other for many years back in the early 2000s uh we each had blogs where we wrote back then almost daily i don't looking at that now i was like oh my god as i'm struggling to do a monthly blog uh, how do you do one daily but we but john uh, had kimba pantare ron at uh, Lean Six Sigma Academy and I at the Evolving Excellence with, uh, with Bill Waddell, I actually co-wrote with me quite a bit. And, uh, and so we knew about that and we each had sort of different things that uh, were our competencies. I was running businesses at the time. I had sort of an online presence. Uh, uh, Ron was a uh, manufacturing director for a large multinational and did a lot of lean manufacturing training, traveling all around the world. Uh, as his family grew. So that was sort of his impetus was to stay home more. And then uh, John, uh, you know, he grew up in Japan. He translated for some of the original Toyota guys. He knew the content probably better than almost anyone in the world right now. And so it's like, how do we get together you know, and do something with this? And, uh, and so that's when we decided back, uh, oh, I don't know, 2007-ish, I want to say, to do something, it took a couple of years to really come together. There were some technologies we wanted to have in place before we launched, uh, so that we could deliver uh, HD level video, which back then, you know, bandwidth wise and all was an interesting trick. And um, Ron taught himself how to do uh, videos. And so that's something we talk about is we're a bunch of lean guys that learned how to make videos as opposed to, you know, video experts that said, hey, let's do some lean stuff. and. Uh, um, I think that works. So, you know, our first videos were shot in Ron's uh, his spare bedroom, I think. And, uh, you know, and with the editing as he was trying to learn it on the side at night. And, uh, you know, I coded the first website somehow that uh, could have probably been hacked into by a five-year-old. And, you know, and, but it's grown from there. And now we've, uh, we, uh, a few years ago, we bought land, built our own video studios in the Dallas area. And, uh, Actually, just launched a project this week to expand that somewhere. So it's it's been a good business. Nice, that's cool. See, I didn't. I, I've always wondered, you know, kind of what the the backstory on that was a little mm -hmm. bit. So your history. Now you talk about it in your book, and I will hold it up because I do own it. And I, before we hopped on, I told you this is one of my favorite ones, and I'm not just saying that because. I'm looking at you. Uh, this was one of the reasons why I asked, I reached out to see if you would come on. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, uh, just recently on LinkedIn, I did a little video tour of my bookcase and I'm trying to get other people maybe to do the same. Cause I always do, anytime I'm on a zoom, I'm always kind of looking behind people to see mm -hmm. what's on their bookcase. So I figured, well, I'll just post what I got. Um, but I've got the same lean books everybody has, you know? Um, so I really liked the simple leader because it's, I'll say, What's the right term? Non-traditional, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to ask you, how did that thought come into your head? Like, when was it that you said, you know what I want to do? I'm going to go write a book, and it's it's going to be a little bit different than you know maybe some some of these other ones that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually almost to clear things out of my head. You know, it was more um, writing. It was more to help me. I want to say uh, and. And the more I talked to people, the more there, you know, it seemed to resonate with some people. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll get this thing down on paper. Uh, and I, you know, I had the idea of writing a book for, for a long time. And it's just, you know, getting started on that and then going through the process is, is a slog. Uh, and organizing book length type of content uh, is, is surprisingly difficult. You know, I, probably to some people, they can just, you know, you know, these serial writers, they just crank through these things, you know, that's not me. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it started back in the, uh, when I was, uh, uh, running this little medical device company and, uh, there was some crazy family medical stuff going on on the side and the stress was getting high and all. And, and it just sort of hit me how some of these concepts, uh, from, from Zen, you know, which I've been exploring just in terms of, you know, I, I got to bring myself back to the present and, uh, to stay focused, uh, to, you know, keep saying myself, while at the same time I was working on the lean side of things, and it's like, huh, there's a lot of similarities between these two of, you know, focusing on flow and being in the present and minimalism and simplicity. And so I just started exploring those concepts from both a professional and personal standpoint, and there's a lot there. And, uh, and so the book was an attempt to, to try to organize that myself and to get that onto paper and to, to free up space in my head so I can 
think of other things in effect. And, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, I, I put it out there. If you go to the simple leader.com, you can download it. You know, it's, it's free. If you want to you know, just read the PDF, you know, I, I personally like reading books better holding them by hand, but you know, it's, it's, it's there. Yeah. I, um, and I'll link to that too, in the show notes. So for those listening later, you can go and, and, and click on it, <clears throat> but I'm with you. I like, I'm still, I like the laying in bed at night. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we, especially now we all, you know, a lot of people are zoomed out. Um, and then we have smartphones that take up an, un, you know, ungodly amount of time. So I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's a half an hour, I just need some time where a video screen is not in my face. I mean, even you go yeah. to a restaurant or bar or anything now, and it's, it's crazy, you know, there's 15 mm -hmm. video screens around and it's like, eh. Sometimes yeah, it gets yeah. to be a little overload. So, mm -hmm. and I like that too, because, you know, your whole, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you talk about it's the nexus of lean and Zen. The, I think the simple fact that you, it's, it's more quiet when you have just a yes. paper in your hands mm -hmm. and it's, you know, versus uh, I, well, just, if you're you're trying to read on an iPad, and I, I you know I, I can't do it because there'll be a notification that pops up or something like that, and or there's just the, the temptation to, you know, who's who's emailed me now, and you know what's going on on Twitter, and you know that kind of. That's why I, I can't. Uh, I don't even you know keep the iPad and phone in the bedroom at night because there's just even even if it's on the other side of the room, there's that temptation that uh, something might be going on, you know, but. It's in another room. I can sleep better. Yeah. And that's agreed. Uh, and I struggle with that. You know, I'm a, real, a small business owner. You know, we have a little consulting firm over here and it's always same thing. You know, I'm getting emails and it's not that anybody necessarily expects an answer at nine o'clock at night, but I still mm -hmm. have that urge. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you think that's an engineer thing. Yeah, or it's an ownership thing. You know, you, you've got, I think it's a sign you've got a true vested interest and excitement and passion for it. You know, um, uh, I should probably be careful with that because, you know, there are people that are just truly addicted to, you know, something might have happened in the last five seconds and I, I should know about it, you know, even if it's the, you know, the Kardashian said something. Yeah. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's true. That's true. Um, I only ask because, you know, we're, yeah, it's, uh, as both engineers, I mean, you're chemical, mm -hmm. I'm mechanical, but I do, I don't know. I just sometimes wonder, cause I do like, we just did a process mapping event with a client. We did it with a group of engineers. Um, and it was, it was this, the, um, scenario, the feeling of it was just different than the day before when we had the sales team in mm -hmm. and, and having done, you know, I've, I've led engineers for 20 some odd years now you do start to see some patterns emerge and how we think and, you know, all that kind of fun mm -hmm. stuff. So I just always like to question, like, what part of my brain is this really coming from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to chat with you too. Um, you've mentioned it, you know, obviously, like I mentioned before we hopped on. So I follow you on Twitter and in LinkedIn. And then I see sometimes you'll post about um, your time as, I think you were ops manager or president of the uh, plastics. In, I think it was injection molding. Uh, well, there, there are a couple. When I was at Abbott, uh, my last position there, I, I ran the molding operations for their salt light plant. And, uh, and that's where I, I really learned about lean. I'd experienced it before, but I had to learn about it there. So that, that was, but then from that point on, I, I used it and explored it and yeah, expanded my knowledge of it. Can you talk a little bit about that at, when at that point in your career, in your learning mm -hmm. curve, um, what did, what were some of the big takeaways for you back then? Like, what did you get right? What did you get wrong? And and looking back today, is there anything you mm -hmm. do different, or is it all like part of the learning oh, process? <laughs> what I do different, boy. Um, yeah, of course, there's a lot there. But this this was back in the, the mid '90s, and I. Uh, you know, when you, when you transfer within a large company, they usually say, do you want to go here? And you're like, yes, of course. And you don't ask any questions. And that's what happened. You know, it's like, yeah, of course I'll go to, and, and, uh, you know, run this 24, seven, 365 molding operation. And, uh, and it was 60 heavy presses, uh, all for internal consumption. So is, is supplying internal plants, uh, is drug cassette components and, and that kind of thing. 
um, and running around the clock every day um, and they were three months behind. So what do you do? You're at 100% capacity or they thought they were uh, and, uh, and you're behind and you've got you know, this extreme corporate scrutiny from shutting down plants in Puerto Rico and you know, North Carolina and all over the place. Uh, so you're getting all this help that uh, you, know, you, you don't really want. And the knee jerk reaction then is we need to buy more presses. And, and so, you know, you know, millions were being spent on buying more of these presses and tools and all thinking that's the answer to capacity, but those were six months out at the time. And so what do you do in the interim as you're falling behind every day? Um, and that's where I reached out to AME and, and met uh, 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 Doc Hall and uh, Dave Hogg and Dan McDonald, some of those guys that have been with AME for a long time. And they're more than helpful. And that's why I've, I've been AME's biggest fan for a long time. You know, they, and the first thing they said is, well, if it's a molding plant and you got a capacity issue, let's talk about quick changeover first. And so they walked me through the, you know, converting internal to external and, you know, some of those processes. And, uh, and it was like a light went off, you know, as we're looking at these presses and we're, you know, we got 120 cavity tool that we're running at six, 60 cavities because we're scared to take the whole thing out and fix it. Um, and, uh, you know, and we're just running the wrong things and so on and so forth. And uh, so we just started to work on this and uh, probably within three to four months, we we're rapidly catching up by just doing better things, learning and doing better things. And that's what taught the team that, wow, this stuff is really working. And that's often the biggest struggle in a, a lean implementation is you don't have a quick win like that to really get people stimulated, but we did. Uh, and so by the time those new presses were coming in after six months, we were ready to retire old presses. We had been caught up and we were retiring old presses. And, uh, and so that was really, uh, holy cow, there really is something here and I need to learn more about it. Mm. Uh, uh, and, you know, at the time it was still a new concept, uh, especially with an Abbott. Uh, and, and so I ended up moving on to, you know, so I could use the, the, the concepts better elsewhere. Since then, though, you know, Abbott's become very good at this, uh, and so I'm, you know, which I'm very happy to see. Yeah. Nice, nice. So, um, can you talk a little bit about how you how you got the team uh, kind of sort of excited? You, know, you mentioned you got a quick win. Um, mm -hmm. Like for instance, a lot of our clients are small to medium sized manufacturers over here in between Hartford and Springfield. We call it Aerospace Alley because Pratt and Whitney's right in East Hartford, and there's a lot of Tier One twos and threes right up and down mm -hmm. the I-91 corridor. Um, and that's one of the things that, uh, you know, we work with clients a lot on is how do we roll this whole thing out? Because even now in 2021, it's still new for some folks, you know, mm -hmm. maybe they did a little yeah. bit of 5S, you know, a few years ago, and you can kind of see there's some signage up and some shadow boards may or may not be getting used anymore. How do you mm -hmm. keep you know, if this was new at Abbott in the plant that you had uh, responsibility for, mm -hmm. how did you get people to try without pushing back real hard at first? It was actually, I was lucky. At that point, it was easy because the, the misery was so great of, you know, people flying in on corporate jets to figure out what's going on and, you know, the nonstop calls from the downstream plants and that kind of thing. So, the, the supervisory team was just like, anything, just show us the way and we'll try it. And, uh, and so, you know, it was a quick win, you know, and, and you could see it from, uh, you know, let's just try anything. And in two weeks, you know, we get one press up and running and, and cranking out more than it had before. And then, you know, it's how fast can we do the same thing for the rest of them? Hmm. Uh, and so that, that was easy. But you know, that, that was an interesting question because I thought that the concepts would then be very translatable to, to future positions. And um, you know, when I was uh, running this medical device company, the silicon company, uh, I was very tool-based at the time. You know, I, was, I had seen lean just through the tools. And, and so you know, we started down the tool path of trying to transform that company a little bit. I, I don't really like the, land, the term transform, but change it to use lean. And, uh, you know, and the tool head of me is like, huh, let's just pick two tools a year and get good at that. Mm. And, uh, and we did that for a couple of years, didn't really go too far until 
uh, I think it was our QA manager, just stopped me in the hallway and said, you know, why? Why are we doing this? And that just stopped me in my tracks, you know, and I had to, to go back and think, you know, really, why are we doing this? And we stopped and we decided that we needed to go back and, and in fact, do a hotion. You know, why, you know, why are we doing this? And, and so we went through this whole process over the course of a year. I've never been a big fan of mission and vision statements. I think they're, you know, they, they hang on walls. No one pays attention, that kind of thing. I've become a very big fan of principles and values. So we, we took a lot of time and it's like, what are our principles and values? What do we want to do? And, and we developed those. Then we uh, looked at the current state. We looked at the future state and we developed this process to, to fill the gaps and, and what tools are then necessary to fill those gaps. And, uh, and that's how we rolled for the next few years. And, and it was very good. We, we, have a, we had a quarterly offsite. We're out here, we're in the middle of wine country. So we, we took the executive staff every quarter to a, a local winery that was half a mile up the road. And we would, uh, the first half of the day is we would challenge our principles and values. Are we still believing what we thought? Um, and then the last half of the day is, okay, based on where we had the gaps, programs and all, are we doing that or do we need to pivot? And, uh, and we'd make some changes and we'd evaluate. And we'd always have a scribe because we'd spent the, the last half of the day just drinking wine with each other. So that was sort of our you know, camaraderie kind of thing. And, uh, you know, and that probably helped you know, develop the team and get everyone on board. But, uh, uh, but that worked very well. Once we had that why and, and, and it was grounded in principles and values, people could see how it was taking us further. And, uh, and, and we, we spent a lot of time on training people. We took uh, people through the five dysfunctions of a team to get everyone so they can be open and honest with each other, which if you've ever done that over a period of time, that can be a brutal process, especially the last phases of, you know, stand up and have everyone criticize you. Yeah, you know, the it's exercises tough. Are, are tough, but when you get through it, the openness you can have as a team is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, so uh, a couple of things popped in my head. I agree with you. I, I make fun of mission statements probably more than I really should because uh, we, we actually consult on quality management systems also. So mm -hmm. part, sometimes it's, you know, especially like quality objectives and all that stuff we have to have, but I'm with you because, you know, in some of our workshops, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on mission statements and I'll say, let me guess, everybody in this room, your mission statement is we strive to be the supplier of choice for product or service yeah. here for blah, 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 blah. Right. And, and it was like, yeah, that's basically what it is. Um, mm -hmm. There was actually one time I went into a, a pretty large, uh, they didn't turn into a client, but a pretty large company. And I had their mission statement from their website. And uh, one guy, you know, I'm going through the whole thing. We we're talking about uh, Hoshin and strategy deployment. Mm -hmm. And he raises his hand. He's like, where is that from? I'm like, where's what from? He's like, well, this statement you've got up here is, you know, I'm like, well, it's, it's yours. <laughs> and didn't, didn't even know, didn't even have a clue. And yeah. this is a giant multinational. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. well, I'll see, there you go. And it was super wordy. It's like 10 sentences long. I'm like, well, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything at that point. It's just like, no. we, we just want to be the best. They're, they're they're kidding each other, you know, themselves and their, you know, their mission is to make a lot of money. Yeah. You know, just, just be honest with yourself if that's the case. Right. Right. But the other thing I, um, that you mentioned is, you know, if I've, as I've done this, I was tool head too, you know, way back, I was at a tier one automotive manufacturer and that's where I kind of started to learn about lean. And it was the same thing. I'm like, Oh, I'm an engineer. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a car guy anyway. So I'm like, Oh, tools. I like, you know, I, what can I do with this fun new toy? Um, I've come to learn more or believe more now that it's really about the relationships that we have with each other. And mm -hmm. to your point, some of the best uh, departments, areas, cells, whatever companies that I've ever worked for or in or with is when we have that open and honest relationship mm -hmm. to say, Kevin, I think that, you know, when you did this or you did that, it's like, I didn't like it. And, you know, did you understand that you could do this? And if you, if we don't respect, trust each other, yeah. then you're going to get defensive. Then I'm going to get angry. Right? The whole thing just, we've seen, we see it play out a million times a day mm -hmm. versus, you know, if you said, geez, Paul, I'm sorry, I didn't even think of that, you know, and then 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's like finding that, I don't know if it's common ground, but. Yeah, well, you know, developing that trust, it, it, it takes work, you know, especially in, in executive roles. You know, you got to be able to listen. You got to be humble. You got to spend time on the gym by just talking to everyone. So they see your face and they ha- they build that relationship. You know, one thing we did that made a big change in our company back then, we had the, the Obeya meeting every morning, you know, and it was a cascading kind of thing. It's there on the shop floor and uh, went up to the departments. And then it, we had our executive staff where we had a video link to the other plants and we would have you know, a stand-up meeting. Uh, but the, the number one, the first topic every, every uh, day was safety. And we were serious about it. You know, you know, did someone trip? We would address it then and, uh, and talk about it. And people saw that and they saw that safety was an issue and they saw that we cared about it and that, that helped develop the trust. Right. Right. And I mean, we, you probably see it online as, as much or more than as I do. Um, you know, sometimes people get these arguments about what is this and what is that? And that's not what lean is. And, um, Mm -hmm. it always kind of drives me nuts because, um, it's like, what are we, what are you trying to get to, you know, at the very end of the day, it's just like you said, it's, um, you know, especially from the executive team, and I don't like the the term transformation either. I, mm-hmm. I rail about the lean transformation failure rate. And, you know, I get people up, some people upset with me because I don't agree that it's, you know, 75, 95%, whatever right. you want. Right? right. Because to your point, it's like, what does that even mean? Transformation? Mm-hmm. What does transformation mean? Like we're done? Because I thought it was right. continuous improvement because you're never done. Mm-hmm. So exactly. And then you, you sort of get into the semantic argument and, uh, you know, like Mark Rabin, he's a good friend of mine. He'll text mm-hmm. me. He's like, will you, will you relax? He's, you know, I'm like, I know, but it just, sometimes it just, it just, uh, you know, it gets me so much, mm-hmm. but back to your point where if we just, you know, we're just people, if we just, like you said, let's go out on the floor or gem, let's go to the Gemba, talk mm-hmm. to the people who are doing it, say, you know, what's frustrating you? What can mm-hmm. I help with? Because, that, you know, even today, I think people still see leaders, you know, air quotes, bosses as uh, power wielders. And to mm-hmm. some extent they are. Um, so I think it's important to exemplify that. Yes, we're going to use that power to try yes. to help you make your mm-hmm. life a little bit better and a little bit easier. Right. Right. I mean, well, when, when they see you making choices, you know, cho- you know a, a classic lean one is, you know, you've improved the process, so you've got more time. You know, what do you do with that more time? You know, you, you, you don't get rid of the person. You, you're like, boy, we have all these other opportunities to work on. You know, help us out there, you know, and, and uh, you know, it, it cascades if you do that. Right, right. And that's where it's just, you know, I've had the discussions before, you know, not, not as a consultant, but as a ME manager that, you know, there's still some people as recently as a few years ago that they're like, yeah, you know, that's all on paper. The savings is all on paper because unless you're reducing headcount, mm-hmm. I'm like, no, you can yeah. t- just, you know, if I can make, you know, 50 of these things in the time it used to take me to make five to your point, mm-hmm. we have this extra time. Where can we use that person's ex, mm-hmm. you know, uh, expertise and go help somewhere else. And I mean, there's, right. I mean, take a look around. We have a, you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet under roof here. There's mm-hmm. a bazillion things we can go do. Right. And right. sometimes people, I don't know. I don't know if it's a cost accounting thing or what. I don't understand. It, it is. And, you know, one of the, the things, you know, on the respect for people side, I was at that really affected me. It was back in the, uh, it had to be the early 2000s. Uh, I, I was at a presentation by Norm Bodek, and he was talking about respect for people. It's his was his big passion, um, and and it you know it. He talked about how the, the cost of the pair of hands is you know accountants go nuts over that. They they understand it. They analyze it six different ways from sundown. You know it cascades up to you know all the you know absorption rates, all that kind of crap. And but there is no offsetting value on the balance sheet for what's in the head. And so it's purely a cost when, you know, all of us know that a person, yeah, there's, there's maybe a payroll cost, but there's all this value too, that is more than balances it out, especially if you use it, right. And, and uh, that's what leads to these companies making these screwball decisions to, 
you know, let's move a manufacturing operation, you know, you know, 2000 miles away to save a buck an hour in labor when, you know, you're going to lose all that experience and knowledge and creativity and all that kind of thing, you know? And so, you know, you, you see these, you know, better companies that understand that and they can redeploy that and, and know that there's value there and they'll, they're willing to wait for it to realize itself through ideas and that kind of thing. But yeah, that, that's Herp, uh, that, you know, the pure accounting mindset. Yeah. And that it, I'm not trying to pick on accountants. So if any, I have any accountants listening, I'm not picking on you. It's just because the, I'm thinking about this one particular uh, person I used to work with. He was not an accountant. Actually, he was a, 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 a business manager. Um, so he had all the cell leaders that reported up to him. So, so it was like an ops manager, but just he was just one of these guys. He just didn't get it. And, and he wasn't listening to me because I was trying to, I'm like, well, you know, just think about this, that. And he's like, eh, he just, you know, you could just, I could just see, you could see it on his face. Um, mm-hmm. And it's interesting, you know, um, one of the videos we use um, is a cell phone video from uh, Carrier. I don't know if you mm-hmm. remember this, but this was all in the news um, in like 2016 because um, uh, Trump got involved. So Carrier had announced they were closing plants in the Midwest and moving them to Mexico. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's actually a cell phone video that somebody uploaded on YouTube from somebody in the crowd. And, and I use a piece of that video in some of the workshops to talk about just what you were describing, because, you know, here you have all these, you know, people that have worked there for umpteen decades, maybe even. Right. And, all, Mm -hmm. you know, and so the video is of the, I, I don't know who it is, plant manager, GM, somebody, and, you know, he's standing at the podium and he's like, just wanted to let you know, we're closing the plant. Sorry, it has nothing to do with you. It's a business decision. Mm-hmm. It's going to go, you know, happen over the course of the next year. And then he says my favorite part, Kevin, and I'll paraphrase. He's like, but, you know, we know we can count on you to do the great job that you've <laughs> always done. And yeah. I'm just, you know, so and actually people will groan in my class, you know, watching mm-hmm. the video. And it's just like. Yeah. Why? To yeah. say, all right, because to your point, you look on a spreadsheet somewhere, and well, we can do the same thing over here, and we're going to save half mm-hmm. a million, a million, five million, whatever it is, over the course of a year. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, but mm-hmm. what about all the what about all the stuff you can't? It's not tangible. Yeah, all the the ideas and creativity that 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 was. You know, especially being back in the you know the molding operation days. You know, the big thing back in the you know the late '90s was. You know, trying to get to a lights out operation, you know, having everything roboticized, you know, just, uh, you know, and, uh, and, you know, it's like, well, I wonder how many ideas those robots come up with every year that help improve the operation. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, what would happen, you know, if you had a, a lights out operation next to one that, yeah, initially was higher cost because there are people involved, but over 10 or 15 years, what would happen side by side on those? Where would they be? Yep. And that I think, yeah, you're right. Cause I have those similar conversations sometimes people, you know, and I have to chuckle a little bit anytime uh, a newspaper will have an article about the robots taking over, you yeah. know, and automation is going to take away 15 to 25% of the manufacturing jobs. And it's like, mm-hmm. all right, didn't I just read this article five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 yeah. years ago in mm-hmm. 1984 from George Orwell, you know, it's like, when is this robot apocalypse supposed to happen? Just so, cause I want to yeah. mark it on the calendar, you know? <laughs> yeah i don't know I, you know and again i'm a career manufacturing guy so i don't know i'm a little j it's my personal opinion but mm-hmm. i i am jaded because to your point robots do one thing great and that's mm-hmm. but that's all they'll ever do you mm-hmm. know and and you know people that like them well they never call in sick and they don't complain and they don't do this that and i'm like yeah but that's all you're ever mm-hmm. gonna get is you're gonna hit go and it's just gonna go and yeah. You know, yeah. what happens when there's a rev change on this widget and mm-hmm. the design changes? I mean, mm-hmm. we got to. Well, that, that, that was really driven home. I, I visited the, uh, the Toyota plant in Kyushu in Japan uh, many years ago uh, as part of a tour. And that's what you really, what you come away with. There's, you know, the robots are used when there's a safety issue or to lift heavy components or, you know, things like that. But everything else is manual and it's not a low cost, you know, country. Uh, by any means, but, and there's very few computers on the floor. Everything is, you know, is manual Kanban on the floor. 
Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, a multi-model, you know, operation, you know, one piece flow. So, you know, they can be building a, a truck and then a, a Lexus sedan and all, you know, just one right after the other. There's no heavy, you know, computers monitoring or controlling that. It's just, you've got your Kanban sequence, you know, with a full and, you know, everyone has the power to stop the line. If people have heard those stories and, and uh, you know, changes are happening all the time. It's, it's, it's incredible to see. Yeah. I haven't been to, I haven't been over to see that. So it's, I'd be interested to, but you know, similar, we, um, uh, Toyota built a, uh, transmission plant in Buffalo, West Virginia. And that was the project I was on when I was in South Carolina. So I did get to go there as they were, it was whole Greenfield site. It was a brand new building, mm-hmm. the whole thing. And so we got to go a few times as they were building it up. And that's one of the things that struck me as well. It's like, where are all the, you know, robots and stuff. And they're like, no, what are you uh-huh. talking about? We actually, they actually, I can remember they had this giant pegboard that they had torque converters on. So once an hour, they'd pull one and keep it there as a rolling 12 hour thing. Hmm. And I'm just, you know, I mean, it looked nice, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, it was just a basic a frame piece of plywood, mm-hmm. you know, it's huh. like, so it, it works. It doesn't have to be space age materials. Right. Mm-hmm. so kevin we do like to take a little short little break and play a thing i like to call the wicked fun part if you're up for <laughs> okay. some some rapid fire questions for you they're but i probably sure. they're all like pg and under so <laughs> okay. uh what do you think about when you're alone in your car which i hope is still your spitfire by the way uh no not by long yeah. no uh, <laughs> haven't had that for a long time but that was a fun project it's like working on a lawnmower but um, what do I think about when I'm alone in my car? I, I, I almost try to think about nothing. You know, that, that's, you know, uh, and, and it sort of goes along with, you know, what I wrote about in the book and all that. It, 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 you try to clear your mind because then it opens up the spaces to think better. Hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, when I was at that previous silicon company, I had a, about a 40 minute commute each way. You know, now my commute is, you're looking at it, but, um, but, you know, and was, that commute was one of the nicest commutes in the world because you go up the Pacific Coast Highway along the ocean, then you dive in and drive 30 miles through vineyards mm. and you pop out at work and you may see a car or two along the way. Um, but that became, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. You know, on the way into work, you know, you think about what are the two or three things that I'd want to get accomplished. And then on the way home from work, you you let work go. And, uh, and I worked hard about I still do about keeping work in its space and its time. And, and, uh, you know, and, and so that was very mentally clearing, I guess you could call it, you know, clarifying in the morning, clearing in the afternoon. Uh, but now when I drive, I, I'm, it's almost always, you know, silence. I rarely have the radio on and it's just trying to think about nothing. Hmm. Interesting. Not even a radio. Huh. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, speaking of that, what is your favorite song and why? Uh, it depends on the time of day, but I, I've always been a Led Zeppelin fan you know, from day one. And so uh, um, Stairway to Heaven has always been up there, Ramble On. Stairway to Heaven is interesting. We we bumped into a couple of stores in our travels uh, that have renamed it Stairway to Kevin. <laughs> so there's little t-shirts and that kind of thing. So yeah, I can't say that that's the reason I really like the song, but that's that's always there. So the, the best rendition of that song, by the way, is uh, the one Hart did at the Kennedy Center Honors many years ago. Mm. Uh, if you get a chance, it's on YouTube. It's incredible. Yeah. Nice. That Yeah, that song ended every junior high and high school dance. I was oh, yeah. About. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a good one. How about uh, what's the funniest thing that's happened to you recently? Uh I'll, I'll, I'll tell you um, something that uh, last year, my wife got us into pickleball, which if any of you ever played that, it's sort of like the hot new game now, I guess. It's sort of a cross between ping pong and tennis and, you know, that kind of thing on a smaller court. And, you know, it's faster. It feels faster than tennis, even though the ball travels slower. It's a shorter court. Um, and, and we do that almost every day now. But, you know, out here on the, on the Central Coast, there's, there's some interesting characters. You know, that, that may have 
used some substances a little too much in their early days. And, and so there's some interesting things that go on. And, and a couple uh, weeks ago, one of them had the idea of, you know, that the courts aren't lighted, that they wanted to keep on playing. And they had a whole bunch of glow sticks. Oh, and so no. it turned into glow stick pickleball where you just had these things, you know, tied onto yourself and it was pitch black. And there's some, uh, you know, I think I might even put a video on Twitter on that because it is just, it is, it is crazy that you're bumping into each other and this thing was floating around and yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> Sounds like fun though. Yeah. Um, what are you working towards now in your free time? Cause I know in the simple leader, you kind of, <laughs> uh, you, you know, you wrote the book, yeah. you, you rebuilt mm-hmm. the spitfire, you right, did a whole bunch of stuff. So what are you up to now? Well, something I work for toward in my free time is to have more free time right now. So I'm, I'm really, you know, this year trying to work at, you know, how do I rearrange work? You know, instead of focusing on how, do, how am I, you know, be more productive at work and what's my best work time, which I wrote about, you know, it's all about, you know, when do I work best? No, I, you know, as I approach retirement, whatever that looks like, uh, I sort of rearrange that to how do I optimize my free time so that I have more time for that? So I've, I've uh, flipped it, I guess. And so I'm, I'm looking at, you know, what am I doing that I don't need to do that I don't want to do? Uh, you know, uh, Greg McGowan's book, uh, Essentialism, had a big impact on me a few years ago. And, and, you know, just saying no to more things and, you know, stopping things. And if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And, you know, that kind of a thing. So I'm trying to apply that to a lot of things. And so, you know, at, as I'm going through the day, I'm trying to analyze what I'm doing and, and stopping what, what, uh, uh, what I can stop. Nice. That's sage advice, I think, because as a career manufacturing engineer, you know, I struggle with that. And I still do today Mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, I can get one more thing done or I can just do, you know, especially now with, I mean, I've been working basically from home for a long time, but I think as everybody's been doing that because of COVID, I think people are starting to understand how the the lines can get real blurry real fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's vitally important to say, because again, we're only here for a short time who, and yeah. we, none of us know how long that's going to be, but mm-hmm. probably not more than a hundred years. And, mm-hmm. you know, nobody lays, you know, on their deathbed and says, oh, you know, I wish I worked more. <laughs> no. I wish I gotten that one project done that one time. You know, mm-hmm. I just, I don't think it happens. And you, you can be passionate about work, but you still have to figure out what that balance is. And, you know, and, and that's when I say, you know, I don't know what retirement will look like because I, I really enjoy what I'm doing now and, you know, helping people improve and teaching and that kind of thing. And, and to some extent, I think that'll continue. But, but there's all these other things that I'd also like to do and, uh, and to slow down and smell the roses and that kind of thing, too. So just making time for that. Yep. And, and yeah, I'm 100%. What's your favorite word? Uh, that's a good one. I have to say some uh, one, probably conundrum, because it's it, it it there's a complexity in that word that you know you, even though I know what it means, a lot of times I'll have to go and look it up. Do I really still understand what that means? But but it also it, it's a you know it's a conflict. A conundrum is a conflict between things, and you know where it's not clear. And, and so it, it, it provokes thought, you know, when there is such a thing, you have to sit back and think about it and, and you learn things that way. Mm-hmm. How about your least favorite word? Oh, geez, that, that's easy. Got just drives me nuts. It's a, it's a cheap word. It, it conveys nothing. When a journalist or something, I see that in an article that, that they say got, you know, someone got something like, oh boy, you know, there's so many better, more descriptive, more elegant ways of saying something, you know, that, that can convey so much more in a single word. You know? hmm. yeah, that always one. peeved me. Has always peeved me. Um, oh, here's a good one for you. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, architecture. And yeah, and it was a tough call in college too. I almost switched to that. I've always been, you know, wanting to design things, you know, design a new house, design, you know, uh, you know, when Gimba Academy bought land and, and uh, built a building uh, a couple of years ago, 
Oh, that was that was a joy to me to, to you know figure that out, work with the art, the real architects on you know how can we lay this out? Because if you if you uh, have looked at video studios, video studios and audio studios, you don't have parallel walls. You have walls that are at angles so that the sound doesn't bounce and that kind of thing. And so there's all these crazy design constraints that you can have. And then how do you build you know an office structure next to it and uh, so if you visit uh, Gimp Academy Studios, for example, Ron's office, which is adjacent to one of the studios, you know, he's got this sort of odd looking office that converts a, an odd wall to a straight wall. And uh, um, so there, there, there's a lot of that going on in there, but I, I love that, that process of figuring out how things can fit and how they can be best utilized. Yeah, me too. That's I'm right there with you. As I can appreciate, as an engineer, I guess I can appreciate mm-hmm. really well done designs that you can tell that somebody somewhere really thought about the usage yeah. and where it was going to fit and how it was going to go. Yeah, um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I yeah, for sure. How about um, one last one? If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Oh, that I've, I've helped people improve their lives. You know, I, I want to extend it beyond just their working life, but just their overall lives. And I think that's sort of the, the impetus to Gimba Academy too. You know, we, the, the three of us have had good careers, you know, uh, through the years. And so uh, Gimba Academy is really a way to give back for that. You know, it's, you know, you know, what AME and, you know, Dan McDonald, Dave Hogg and, you know, Doc Hall and those guys, uh, did for me in my early days, you know, I, I want to do the same thing for other people and, you know, and Ron and John feel the same way. And so we've always had this philosophy from day one that if we deliver value, the business will come and that, that works. It works very well. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I want to be able to give back. I want to know that's my you know, biggest thrill is when someone says that I've helped them or you know, helped them improve. Yeah, me too. Um, that's the uh, most fun part of my job is when mm-hmm. somebody comes up to me and says, Hey, you know, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, I don't have to work 60 hours a week anymore and we're getting more mm-hmm. out. And, you know, I feel, I feel better about myself when I walk out of here at three thirty, four o'clock or whatever my shift in, you know, um, mm-hmm. I don't feel spent, you know, and I have time for the kids now and we can, you know, just, because you're right. I don't know. I get philosophical maybe, but you know, I think respect for people is that's, that's really what it's all about. It's, you yeah. know, and, and sometimes I think we confuse that, you know, that, you know, if, if life gets easier, then we can just start filling up that with more work stuff. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, no, it, no, that's not what we're here for. I think we're here for, you know, Mm-hmm. And I don't like the work-life balance. That's part of what my chapter on my no. book was. The work-life balance, I hate that because it's like, no, it's just life. We have to balance right. everything. Work's part mm-hmm. of it. But Well, and if, you, if you're doing it right, or if you're lucky enough maybe to do it right, you know, work becomes life and they're both pleasurable. And it's just figuring out, you know, what is what? And maybe you don't have to. Maybe it's this continuum instead of, you know, you come home and you do this and you go to work and you do this. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, pretty, I've, I've known folks that have done that, you know, and, and you blink and 20, 30 years go by and it's like, you look around, you're like, what happened? I I just Mm -hmm. never wanted to end up that way. Right. So, okay. We got just a few minutes left and then I'll, I'll leave you alone. Um, Is there anything that you wanted to mention to anybody to think about or consider? Um, Well, I, I, We've talked about it a little bit, you know, but the, the respect for people is, I don't think people realize how important, how critical to lean and just overall improvement that is. And, and <clears throat> it's, it's a little controversial, but that, that's sort of my bone to pick with Lean Six Sigma too, is, you know, I, I have yet to meet, uh, you know, a Lean Six Sigma program that really does respect for people well. You know, it's and uh, which is too bad because Six Sigma is a great uh, program. Lean is a great program. You know, Lean Six Sigma, unfortunately, I think tends to be a bastardization of both, and it becomes very tool oriented. So, you know, where is the respect for people? Where is Hoshin in Lean Six Sigma? You know, again, 
probably you know, another critical aspect of lean of knowing where you're going. Um, so where is that? You know, and uh, you know, we at Gimba kind of, we've got uh, a Lean Six Sigma certification as well, and we try to incorporate that in. But uh, but that's when I look out at, at most programs, I don't see that, and uh, and so um, I think really learning what respect for people is, and and as John Miller has written a few times, you know, it's respect for people is really minimizing what it is. It's really respect for humanity. It's, you know, you, you respect your customers and your suppliers and your community and the, the world. And, you know, it's, uh, it's why, you know, if you go to, you know, the Toyota Kyushu plant, for example, they have the smokestacks are yellow, you know, so that the community can see that they're not getting, you know, tarred up. They're, they're still yellow. So, uh, you know, there's nothing bad going into the air. And mm. you know, so there's, there's a lot of that going on and how you're contributing to society, how you're improving everyone. I, I couldn't put it in any better myself, Kevin. I, it's, um, I don't know if it's an old age thing. I, I don't know when I'm getting, as I get <laughs> older, it, but I, I do, I, you know, I look around and I just think, what is it all for? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, at the end, it's got to be to to leave the world a better place. So. There you go. Well, Kevin, again, I honestly I can't thank you enough. Um, I'm yeah, sorry that you. we couldn't hang out in Chicago at AME. I know you were supposed to go and you couldn't make it at the last minute, but mm-hmm. hopefully, I know AME this year is virtual again. Um, but hopefully, yeah. maybe knock on wood next year, wherever mm-hmm. that may be, we can finally uh, Dallas. Meet it. Yeah, is that what it is? Dallas, 2022. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. Hopefully I'll see you in Dallas. Okay. Look forward to it. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you. Take it easy. See you. Hey, everybody. It's Paul. Before I let you go, I just wanted to say thanks again for listening. Um, You've really made doing this podcast a very rewarding experience for me. Uh, I get a lot of messages from from listeners. and uh, You know, everyone has something nice to say, which I very much appreciate. Uh, of course, I'm always open to you know, uh, feedback on ways we can make it better. I mean, that's Kaizen, after all. And by no stretch do I claim to have got this all figured out. So if there's things that I could do better, please, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out and let me know. And likewise, if there's a somebody that you think would be a great guest, um, also let me know. Um, you know, there's a chance I don't know who those, who those folks are. So somebody that you can help put us in touch with, you know, somebody you want to learn more about, certainly let me know and I'll reach out uh, to those folks. But um, I hope you find the podcast fun and entertaining, uh, uh, educational, and, and maybe even a little inspirational, I hope. Um, that's really what I'm, I'm going after with this whole thing. So thanks again. And uh, one small ask. Uh, if you don't mind, if you listen, you know, whatever your preferred platform is, if you could just, you know, subscribe, uh, give us five stars on Apple or, or whatever, again, whatever platform you listen to, it just, it, it helps, um, you know, the algorithms like it. So if you could do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks, everybody.